Good morning, everybody. We're, this is a nice full house here today. It's a delight to look out and see all of your happy faces and to have the sunlight flooding in. Um, I've got a, quite a list of announcements today, so please bear with me. Uh, sort of the, the lead uh, off was that the, um, what the session's been doing when it comes to the whole question of masks and distancing and so on is we just monitor what the uh, consensus from the government and the CDC is. And uh, what, what seems to be going on now is that the state publishes once a week the map of the counties and how we're doing and the, the coding system is sort of red, yellow, green, right? So when we were green last week, the session said, well, we can go to masks optional now. And then the very next day, the map was published showing that this county is yellow again. So just so you know, that's what we're doing. If it's yellow, then we recommend masks for what they call congregate settings. What could be more of a congregate setting than a congregation? Um, but that, uh, you know, it's just the individual discretion once we toggle over to green. Uh, so just, just for the record, on Friday, they switched us to yellow for this county. <laughs> um, a few things about events. Um, originally, there was going to be a wildflower walk this afternoon, but it was rescheduled. So it's not today. Uh, it was rescheduled to April 10th, which is Palm Sunday. This was uh, driven by the wildflowers themselves. Um, now, this Wednesday at noon, as part of our Linton study series, we will be featuring Mark Ritter. I uh, was doing a presentation on environmental activism and uh, you know, nature and gardening is the overall theme this year. Um, Mark is active with the, I hope I got this right, Sierra Club, right? And um, all, of this, uh, all of this is in the publicity and it's in the calendar, so I'm just replicating all that. The difference, the reason I'm announcing this in particular is that it's going to be Zoom only. So if you want to participate, you're going to need to look up that Zoom link. It's actually in the brochure, uh, but the church office can also help you and Mark can help you and anyone from the Christian Education Committee can help you uh, to participate by Zoom at noon this Wednesday. Um, now, still in the events part, <laughs> next Sunday morning before Sunday school, there's an event for youth. Uh, they're going to be painting rocks that we're going to use in our worship service on Palm Sunday. Um, and the church is providing pancakes for them, pancakes for painters, um, starting at 945. Uh, so this really is not a y'all come kind of thing. It's mostly for the youth, although some adults have been recruited to help with it. Um, choir will begin practicing again this coming Wednesday, and uh, this is one of those great opportunities if you've been thinking that you'd like to sing, uh, you would be very welcome. And uh, Emily Barclay told me so, so straight, straight from the top, she would really love to have more singers, uh, and so try it out. Um, okay, so that's all for events. Uh, a couple of prayer concerns. Uh, many of you have known and loved B.J. Helton Davis for a long time. Her sister, Barbara Hoyle, passed away uh, this past Wednesday morning. Um, she says that contributions can be made to the American Cancer Society or to the, this church's Remembrance Trust Fund. Um, and she said, B.J. says, I have so appreciated your messages of support. Uh, also, we have a prayer concern for Jenny, the daughter-in-law of Bill and Mary Cheek, whose uh, medical issues have become more acute lately. So let's just go ahead and pray for both of those families. Oh Lord, uh, we thank you for all the ways that you sustain hope and health, um, and we, we grieve the loss. Uh, we join BJ in grieving the loss of her sister. We pray that your Holy Spirit would uh, provide comfort to her. I know that um, her daughter Mandy is going to be doing the eulogy, and so we pray that you would give her the, the strength and the wisdom to do that. And we pray for uh, Jenny and her family as they uh, chip in to help her cope with her medical situation. 
Uh, all this we may pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, and that is it on the announcements, unless somebody wanted to add something. If not, uh, let's open ourselves to a spirit of celebration, celebration that we have this time together, time when we can explore and embrace the very fullness of life that God gives. It's a fullness that will make us a living testimony to God's love, grace, and mercy. Amen. Amen. Feel free to join me in standing for our call to worship as printed in the bulletin. Um, and after the call to worship, or as part of it, we're going to sing a hymn that Roland will play all the way through once before we sing it. As we gather, O oh Lord, help us let go of the things that trap us, the fears that silence us, the anger that haunts us. As we gather, O oh Lord, help us let go of the worry, stress, or anxiety that have filled us. As we gather, O oh Lord, help us to pick up the gift of your grace, your love, and your life that fills us. As we gather, O oh Lord, help us pick up the gift of each other. We are not alone. Jesus Christ is among us today. Alleluia. Amen.
be seated, or rather everyone except the family of Caroline Collins Brady. Uh, you all can come on forward for the baptism today. And uh, while they're coming up, let me just say a word about this cloth that's hanging here. Uh, Caroline's dad, John Brady, this embroidered baptismal cloth was present at his baptism. So it's a lovely detail today. Good morning, Caroline. Hey. Good morning. Got quite a crowd up here, so I'm going to put my mask on. And so let me introduce this crowd. Um, of course, uh, you all know Karen and John Brady and their daughter, Caroline, is making a bit of a debut here, although you've been here before. <laughs> and Janice and Ellen are back here, well known in this congregation. And then Peggy and Jeff Brady are John's parents, and they've been here before too. So welcome, everybody. Uh, Jonathan, if you would introduce this event. Caroline Collins Brady. Her parents are Karen and John Brady, and Karen is a member of this congregation. Thank you. So an infant baptism involves a commitment to raise a child in the Christian faith together as a nuclear family and also as a larger church family. So I have some questions both for the parents, for the larger family, and for the whole congregation. John and Karen, do you desire that Caroline be baptized today? Yes. Yes. Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to your child? Do you? Yes. Family members, let me ask you as well, do you promise through prayer and example to support and encourage Caroline to be a faithful Christian? Do you? Yes. yes. Congregation, do you, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture this child by word and deed with love and prayer? Amen. Will you encourage her to know and follow Christ and be a faithful church member? Amen. You know what? We're going to have children's time immediately after this baptism. If you children want to come up on the front pew where you can see better, you can come ahead and do that now. I meant to invite you up before, and I see you're really, really working to see. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, come on up. Okay. Thank you for coming up. I'm going to pour some water into the baptismal font. That's what we call this. Through baptism, we enter the covenant that God has established. Within this covenant, God gives us new life, guards us from evil, nurtures us in love. So I'm going to ask the whole congregation to stand now to answer along with the parents so that we can profess our faith and renew our own baptismal vows by answering these questions. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? Do you? Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? Do you? Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? I will with God's help, is what we usually say. I will with God's help. Let us pray. O oh Lord, send your spirit to move over this water that it may be a fountain of deliverance and rebirth. Pour out your Holy Spirit on Caroline, her family, and this congregation, that we may all continue forever in the risen life of Christ. Amen. Everybody can be seated again. Thank you. Caroline, I'm going to put a little water on your head. Is that okay? Just a little bit. Caroline Collins Brady, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. O Lord, in your heavenly grace, grant that Caroline may continue yours forever. 
and daily increase in your Holy Spirit until coming to your everlasting kingdom. Child of the covenant, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ forever. Amen. Let's step out here where absolutely everybody can see you in the middle. And they're going to say something to welcome you. Sisters and brothers all, God has made this child a member of God's household to share with us in worship and service. Let's welcome this newly baptized, reading together the declaration in our bulletins. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you into Christ Church to share in the ministry of Christ where we all are one. Thank you all so much. And I think as you return to your pew, since you chose one at the very back, everyone will get a chance to, to wave and say hi. God bless you. Thank you so much for, for being part of this. And let us just keep this out for the rest of the service, and then we'll make sure you get it back safely. <laughs> And now, Christy Brock has a special message for the kids. There we go. All right. Good morning. Look, this is just so awesome to see everyone's face this morning. And we had a holiday that we celebrated on Thursday. Does anybody remember what that was? It was St. Patrick's Day. You're exactly right. And um, I love the story about St. Patrick because a lot of people don't really know that he wasn't Irish. Some people didn't know. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well. He was captured. You are correct. He was an Italian, and he was, correct. Uh, he was born into a noble family um, around the year 385 A.D., um, he was, pardon me, captured as a young man by Irish raiders and taken to Ireland where he was a slave. For six years, he escaped, after six years, he escaped to his native country where he became a priest and wanted to share Christianity with the Irish people. He l returned to Ireland where he spread um, the word of Christ. What color do we think of that has to do with St. Patrick's Day? Green, right. And what, what green thing do, comes to your mind first that, that kind of makes you think about? Uh, yes, and sometimes we call those shamrocks. They, oh, you sure do. This is kind of what a shamrock looks like, right? Have you seen these before? How many leaves does it have? does have three. This one has three. Um, and these leaves touch each other, but they aren't attached to each other, right? They're all sort of on their own. A shamrock is one thing, not three things, though, because they are attached by what? The stem, correct. Shamrocks can actually help us understand God. Three distinct beings. What three distinct beings do you think I'm talking about? I would like for one of these children to come up and do this children's sermon for me now because, uh, yes, that is exactly right, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So um, we have several Bible verses, of course, that talk about I am the Father and the Father is in me. Um, Jesus said, and now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised. Um, so how could Jesus send something and be something? It's because he is distinct. Um, in Christianity, we believe that there is only one God, and it's like this shamrock. There are three distinct leaves. And what I especially like is that they're shaped like hearts also, aren't they? They are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yet the shamrock is one thing. It isn't three things. And God is one thing as well. Can we say a prayer together, please? Thank you, God, for showing us that simple things in nature can help us understand more complicated things. In Jesus' name, amen. 
All right, we have a tradition at our church where we have the children say, God be with you, and we all say, God be with us all. If you all would join me now in the prayer of confession. Abundant God, so much of our harmful behavior is rooted in our envy. You have given us our manna, our daily bread, but we want more. We have allowed ourselves to be seduced by commercialism, telling ourselves that we are not complete until we have the nicest of things. Forgive us when our actions convey that you are not enough for us. Help us to live our lives simply and faithfully, trusting in your steadfast love to provide all that we need. Amen. Friends, our salvation is not something we can purchase with money or fame. Our salvation comes from Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. I announce to you this day our sins are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. prayer for illumination. Please join in the spirit of prayer. Shine your light on our paths through this reading, O Lord, that we might come to know and follow you more nearly. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. It may be found on page 6 in your New Testament. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Our second reading is from Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 12. It may be found on page 187 in your New Testament. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. 
In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well fed and of going hungry, of having plenty, and of being in need. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I attended a sort of prayer meeting by Zoom uh, with pastors in Ukraine. Uh, with a lot of logistical challenge involved, the organizers got ministers from a variety of churches and places in Ukraine to come on this Zoom call to say something, lead a prayer. And I was particularly struck by um, one of these Ukrainian pastors in particular he opted to use his time on Zoom to drive his car around while talking to us, and occasionally he would turn his camera toward a scene that he wanted the world to see, such as Russian soldiers and their tanks blocking passage on a street. This pastor's face was filled with dismay and disbelief, but also I think determination. It has to have been risky, right, for him to drive around like that as if he were a roving reporter like he did that day. So it was one of those poignant moments where, um, you know, the kind of moment that leads you to ask, what would I do? This coverage that we're seeing of the Russian invasion of Ukraine is affecting us. It's, it's bringing up a lot of strong feelings, certainly mostly negative ones. But I hope it's okay to say that some parts of this news also inspire us and move us, like this brave man using his brief international connection to show us his true experience. But even more than that, what I'm inspired by every time I hear this phrase about the children is how many children are being taken out of Ukraine for their protection. You know, societies just chug along, trying to meet as many of the expressed needs of the people as they can. And then come these clarifying moments, like this one, when the light shines on what is really most precious to us all. And what's most precious is the lives of the little ones. Not because they're the future of Ukraine, if Ukraine has a future, but just because. Just because most adults who are ever charged with the care of children have that clarifying moment. It's the moment when you realize that whatever else you've got going on, your main responsibility is to care for these little ones. We experienced a demonstration of a highly focused view of life this morning. What are the intentions that we state during the baptism of an infant? Together and in support of parents and family, we're saying that we have one pure intention with regard to Caroline or Jackman or Oliver, just to name the most recent infants baptized here. That intention is to raise them to know that God loves them. Raise them to know they're part of the family of God that Jesus calls us into. We're saying that this is where our heart is, and so this is where our treasure will be also. Matthew 6 passage said to us this morning, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In case all you can hear in that is a kind of a negative slant, like a, a call to look for where you're committing an idolatry, let me turn it around in a positive and constructive way. Where your heart is, there is where your treasure should be also. Think about it that way in a positive way. I mean, isn't that the conclusion? and the positive constructive step for us to consider, that our job <clears throat> is to discern where our heart is, 
what good is most important to us, and then to align our time and our gifts and our financial resources accordingly. If we're putting out time, gifts, pursuits, and finances elsewhere, we're not being single-minded. Well, some of you will have um, read or be aware of a book written by Soren Kierkegaard, the title of which is Purity of Heart is to Will One Thing. This 19th century Christian existential thinker argued that the only way to will one thing truly is to will the good. Otherwise, we'll be double-minded when we should be single-minded. For instance, we can't will only the good if at the same time we're embracing a goal of not being punished. If, we, if what we really will is lots of good goals but no suffering or inconvenience for ourselves, we're not really being single-minded. We're not being simple in that way. That pastor in Ukraine could have willed for the truth to be known and just hoped that a journalist would drive around with a camera instead of him, for instance. Well, similarly, we, we can't will only the good while also harboring a self-centered desire to win, a willful drive to personal victory. Then we're also putting too many conditions on our main goal, splitting it, making us double-minded. Suddenly, the goal of loving your neighbor turns into apparently loving your neighbor so that you can look good and win the election or woo that person, just to give one example of where a kind of double-mindedness can lead us. Well, Kierkegaard wasn't talking about everyone adopting some goal that would be heroic by worldly standards. He, he wasn't even talking about fame or social status at all. Here's what he was talking about. He was talking about every single one of us standing before God and saying, what I'm dedicating my life to, I see it as consistent with my eternal value in your eyes. It is sacred because I dedicate it to you and the goodness that you intend for me and for us all. Try to imagine yourself standing before God and saying that about your life. So seen this way, the will to will the good with singleness of heart and mind is possible for every person, regardless of life circumstances. Well, if you attended our adult vacation Bible school study of the book of James a few years ago, you'll remember that single-mindedness is practically the main theme of that book of the Bible. He used metaphors like reins and rudders to call attention <clears throat> to what determines the direction of our lives. He cautioned people that even a glib or gossipy tongue can, like a rudder, make the ship of life veer off course. So he exhorted his people and us, if we'll listen, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. I have to look up the Greek word for double-minded. Purify your hearts, you double-minded, he said. Well, a dear friend of mine was reminiscing the other day about what I think is now called a quarter-life crisis. You know, we used to only talk about midlife crises, but now I'm hearing this quarter-life crisis. When he was in his early 30s, this dear friend had finished two graduate degrees, had recently become a professor for the first time, was married, and had two preschool-age children. He was just blown away by all the responsibilities that he had assumed. It all was hitting him at once. All the structure, all the demanding expectations in his life. And it troubled him enough to seek out a therapist to talk about it. After listening for a while, the therapist asked quite simply, what did you expect? Well, this is a kind of a two-edged question, isn't it? I mean, it, you could hear it as, 
when you were undertaking all these changes in your life, where did you think it was leading or what were your expectations or toward what direction did you intend to be steering? But another way to hear it's a little more judgy, isn't it? Anyone can see where those changes would lead, so why are you so surprised, dummy? Probably the therapist didn't mean it in that judgy way. But for my friend, the conversation was just a big splash of cold water, like a sort of ice bucket challenge. And his takeaway was, yep, time for me to grow up. I've got to embrace the commitments I've made and try to steer them in the direction of the good. The single-minded orientation of one's life around the good or around a good that's a way I, I like to think about simplicity. There are other ways that I like less than that. When we want to have greater simplicity, too often I think we think about uh, a kind of frenetic elimination, reduction, clearing the decks process, which can do some damage. I worry about that approach to the spiritual discipline of embracing simplicity. Being of one mind, being single of mind, is not about the quantity or the diversity of one's interests, as much as it's about whether they can all relate to the eternally good reason that you, and you in particular, are on the face of the earth. We heard, tis the gift to be simple this morning. Many people were attracted to the shaker way of life, it's a shaker song. They were thinking, many of them, that it was just about re reducing and streamlining. A lot of people join the shaker communities to shed worldly possessions and commitments and just simplify life down to the purity of work and worship. But that could be a mirage. A professor of political science at the University of Louisville read the diaries kept by the shakers at Pleasant Hill, and one found one that was written by a man who stayed double-minded the whole time he lived there. You know, they have a house where people lived until they were ready to fully commit to the life there. No one was coerced to jump in, but this man went ahead and committed without fully committing. Outwardly, he was living a simplified life but inwardly, truly, his life was a torment. The other day, I downloaded a funny meme in which a person holds up a sign through the car window that says, you're creating problems in your head again. Stop that. <laughs> it's funny, but our lives are poor. If there, our lives are poorly aligned around a vision for the good, our minds will continue to create problems for us just as happened for that unhappy shaker. So for me, embracing simplicity isn't about eliminating diversity or creating lots of empty space or a static life with no changes in it. It's about harmonizing, orchestrating, accepting while also creating. I think the shaker song captures that truth because it talks about turning and turning until you come round right, bending, working, but finding love and delight. We love that song they sang, tis the gift to be simple, the gift to be free. I think because we can find ecstasy in the circling and swirling of life, not in rigidity. A Lenten examination of our lives with the lens of single-mindedness versus double-mindedness therefore asks, I believe, that we gently and lovingly look at why we have the involvements that we have. Are they part of what we want to stand before God and present as our life's offering, the eternal good that we are about? Can they become more so? Can we keep these involvements but cleanse our motives, rid them of fear, rid them of willfulness? 
Or if not, can we disengage for a while or even permanently to make sure that our treasure is where our hearts are? As James wrote, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. It's an interesting way uh, that this congregation has become more of one mind, more single-minded in just the last few months. The Christian Education and Nurture Committee polled the parents of children involved in our activities, and one of the priorities that emerged was to foster fellowship and friendship among the children. Well, this is in large part a response to what the pandemic has done to kids' social lives. But it's also because our kids don't all go to the same schools, and if we want them to grow up to be participants in our youth activities, we need them to want to see each other, to feel comfortable connecting with church, to feel inspired and welcomed here. So looking at our programs through this lens of fellowship for the younger kids, the view of our programs came into greater focus and unity. Committee members stepped up to start new fund-generating events. Then a fresh look through this lens at the language and literacy program led by Rachel Shaw helped us to see the extent to which it has in fact evolved to be a fellowship event first and foremost and, and can be a pillar of this focus on inspiring and fun social life for children. And this conversation didn't stay in one committee. After all, fellowship is the name of another standing function. It's always been more of a team than a committee and Melissa Jensen, who leads it, is enthusiastic about using some of the resources at her disposal to support fellowship efforts that serve children. And then there's outreach, evangelism, and communication led by Jonathan Philpott. Friend making is an essential part of outreach, and a fair number of the children who attend our activities have parents who are not members here. Why not be more intentional about connecting with them? You see, through all of these insights and conversations, the priority of caring for the little ones, especially through friendships, began to help separate areas of our church life see the extent to which goals and priorities could overlap in one more unified team approach. We're becoming more one-minded as a congregation during Lent. What about us as individual members? Won't you join me in giving this some more thought? I've been very active in applying this lens to my own activities of late, and I, I hope that you will find it as inspiring and helpful as I am finding it. Let's pray for that. If you'll join me in the spirit of prayer. Gracious God, as we in our own imagination see ourselves standing before you, Help us to look at our lives as you do. Help us to see what is of eternal value in us and in our various activities. Help us to see where we may be of two minds instead of one and do something about that so that by turning, turning, we come round right. We appeal to your love, grace, and mercy. Amen.
Join me now as we enter into a time of prayer for, for our world and for ourselves. Gracious God, we thank you for the beauty of nature and of this day, for the promise of spring as we look at buds getting larger and flowers blooming, for the sounds of birds. We thank you for all that undergirds that life itself. Thank you for the community of church and pray that uh, our church and all churches uh, could be of great service to your ends in this world. And speaking of this world, we, we pray for world peace, that nations could learn to live together in harmony. And we pray for everyone who's suffering, um, displaced people, of course, people who are afraid every night of bombs, uh, but people we know who are lonely, uh, who are ill. May your spirit grant hope and insights to everyone who's suffering and insights into how to help them to everyone else. And above all, we pray for the welfare of all children, that we might step up to our responsibilities for them. And now praying together the prayer that the Lord taught to his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may stand now, if you'd like, uh, for singing our closing hymn, Go, My Children, With My Blessing. God's presence and listen for God. Let your listening hearts hear God's love for you and for the world. 
Let your listening ears discern God's voice from those that might distract you. Let your listening soul be attuned to the spirit that speaks deep within you. May God's love surround you. May Christ's love fill you. May the Spirit's love empower you. Amen. Amen.